Well, good evening to you. This is Jeffrey Tucker at Liberty.me. And, and uh, tonight, we're going to be talking about Hayek's incredible, epic, awesome, never to be forgotten, constantly to be read, always amazing article, The Use of Knowledge in Society from 1945. And I'm very happy to talk about this article because this article has been something of a discovery in my own life. And you know, you always feel passionate about things you're you're just now discovering it versus you know that which you you sort of already knew, um, and this article eluded my understanding for so long, and uh, frustrated me because I couldn't I couldn't quite figure it out. Uh, now when I reread it, I'm just overwhelmed at just the intellectual robustness of the of the piece, and just what it means for um, for the social sciences and for our understanding of, of the world. I mean, I agree with many people who have said that this is probably the single most important article on the social sciences that appeared in the 20th century. So that's really saying something, obviously. That's, that's an immense and awesome claim, uh, hard to sustain. Um, and it's uh, even more intriguing when you consider that this is probably, I think this is, um, this is true, that this remains the single most cited article in the economic literature in the last hundred years. And that's pretty much as long as the economic literature has even existed. So this is, in a way, the most famous article ever written. It's also probably the most important from a methodological and empirical point of view. Uh, the one that um, is most radical and most serious and provides uh, the largest agenda for research and understanding of our world of, of any article that's, that's, that's ever been written uh, thus far in economics. And yet, I would also say that it's probably the single most ignored article of our time. I, the paradox is extraordinary. In other words, if this article were taken seriously, if it were read by everybody, not just merely cited, but, but really read and, and, and understood, um, the world would, uh, social sciences would be very different and the world would be a very different place. So that's why I think it's such an important piece. It, you can't ever stop reading it in a way. Uh, it just needs to be read and reread, uh, understood again and again. In fact, I don't think that it could ever be fully understood, <laughs> which is a, something of a paradox, but this article is about knowledge and the limits of our own knowledge and about the intellectual pretense of presuming that we can know what, in fact, we cannot know, uh, just simply uh, because we constructed a, a, a scientific world that requires that we have this knowledge that, in fact, we don't have access to. So, um, in many ways, the article is, is, is a searching document. It's a, it's a contemplative um, and investigative and speculative uh, piece of writing that nonetheless, despite it's it's a little bit uh, a little bit elusive quality, nonetheless is is so radical and bang on. It just it 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 goes to the very heart of the way the social sciences emerged in the in the twentieth century and just eats it. I mean, it just utterly destroys the very core of everything we think that social science really is, and attempts to replace it with with something different, something more humble. And ironically, and even though this isn't the actual subject of the article, that that he wants to replace it by is totally consistent with Hayek's view uh, about human freedom it's, itself. It's the, it's the kind of piece that you never stop thinking about once you've read it. It's the kind of thing that, that keeps you up at night, um, uh, uh, obsesses you, um, it, it, it penetrates your brain, and never lets you go, and and truly, you can, nothing ever looks the same again after you after the after you've understood and comprehended this article. Now, I can't even begin to somehow articulate the implications of this piece in the course of this short time we have together, <clears throat> um, because I'll admit to you that it took me, you know, basically. Uh, 25 years between the time when I first read it and when it finally I finally figured out what the article is driving at 
I mean, that's how serious it is. So I, I want to tell you a little bit my, about my intellectual biography as we go along here, and and why this article uh, is is has taken on such significance in my own life uh, and my own understanding of the world. Um, so um, we'll start from the beginning and and kind of treat the article in its intellectual context. But let me say before I, before I begin that I finally have figured out how to leave open the chat window of uh, the liberty.me uh, link here, uh, which you can go to liberty.me live and just click on the top left uh, thing there. If you're watching this purely on Google Hangouts, you can do this and enter our chat room and we, we can chat, which I would love, by the way. I would, I would love to get some interaction and some comments from anybody about whatever uh, you want to talk about uh, as it relates to this piece. OK, now let's go back to the year um, when, it, when it appeared. This was 1945. And, and it, one of the things I think we make big mistakes at as historiographers and intellectual historians and just thinkers in a, in a public space is to disconnect an article from its time. We, we treat articles and writings as if they're just floating abstractions, you know, disconnected from the person who wrote it uh, and the personality and the personal conflicts and issues that were driving that. And OK, good. So I see that I've got a chat message, and that's good, but it's making a noise. So I'm going to see what I can do about turning that off. Real quickly, I'm so sorry. Because uh, I don't, I don't want you to have to be here. <laughs> so this is what I need to get rid of. Is this sound? I'm so sorry. My apologies for the delay here. Yeah, that's just not going to work, is it? I need to find to the right, to the right, to the right. I'm gonna have to. Oh, I'm my deepest apologies. I'm just, just gonna take me. I spent a long time trying to figure that. Ah, there we go. And it is off. But dink. And I am now back to being a master of the universe with no weird things. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, good. So welcome. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so I was just saying that one of the great mistakes we make as readers, as intellectuals, as people seeking to understand the world and, and our history, is to divorce an article from the personality of its writer, the times in which it was written, the personal issues and conflicts that the writer faces, faced, the the um, world affairs that that gave rise to the piece, the the prehistory uh, that led to the piece, and um, you know all the kind of human issues that are associated with it, the courage it took to write it, the extent to which writing an article like this um, fit in with the, the intellectual sector in which it appeared, the publisher, you know, why was it published? You know all these factors, you know. I would say that all these sort of personal sociological issues associated with the sort of meta issues associated with why an article exists at all are probably, in a sense, more important than the article itself, or at least equally important. Um, so, uh, so let's just kind of quickly reflect on what it means that this article was written in 1945. So we're, we're you know. Um, just for starters, this is in the middle of the, of, of, uh, the most ghastly period probably in the history of humanity outside maybe the Black Death in Europe in the 14th century or something like that. Um, uh, you know, the, 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 the Holocaust of Jews in Germany had commenced in an industrial fashion, uh, killing, killing millions of people for as a culmination of a eugenic uh, exercise in, in what? In hatred of Jews, yeah, but more importantly, I'd say, and more substantially, um, in the desire to plan the world. 
and to use state power to make the world we want it to be. Whatever our vision of that is, that's what it was all about. I'm sorry, um, guest Douglas, um, the article in question is the use of knowledge in society. In fact, let me see if I can actually give you a copy of this article in the chat. Um, use of knowledge in society. Okay. We also have an edition of it on liberty.me with, I think, an introduction by me. Um, okay, so we, we've got the Holocaust. We've got, we've got uh, the, in, in Russia, we have now, you know, 40 years after the, uh, the, the Bolshevik Revolution, uh, another Holocaust occurring against the kulaks, against property owners, uh, with 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 famine uh, widespread again, killing millions upon millions of of people. Um, we're yet to see the same thing happen in China. It's it's going to happen, and um, you know the massive demographic uh, graphic upheaval, um, t terrible evil all over the place, and in the U.S and in cooperation with Britain, we've got basically another a mass murder taking place in the name of stopping tyranny um, uh, with the, the, the you know, hardcore development of, of nuclear weapons that allowed, uh, that allowed great powers like the US or whoever happened to get them to be able to decimate, wipe out, destroy, uh, slaughter, uh, mass murder on a scale that had never been seen in the history of the world. So all that that I just gave you is the, is the bloodshed. That's, that's just the, the pure carnage that, uh, that this article uh, was written amidst. Um, coming after now, um, you know, a long period of wartime planning, both in the US and in, in Britain and then all over Europe with the rise of fascism, rise of socialism, but the rise of, of economic planning in the U.S. and 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 the U.K. with um, uh, widespread price controls, massive uh, rationing and deprivation, uh, material deprivation, in every direction, uh, huge amounts of censorship, uh, unprecedented amount of taxation that was robbing people, es essentially enslaving people and robbing them of their earnings to feed a war machine totally dedicated to killing and, and destruction. Okay, so that's, that's a picture of the world in 1945. So if you think that we live, we've got it bad now, <clears throat> please, my friends, consider how far we've come. Uh, nothing remotely like this exists in the world today. This is the apex. The, the culmination of statism as it had been imagined uh, uh, in the late 19th century. This was the fulfillment of, of, of the plans of intellectuals. There wasn't just that bad men like Hitler and like Stalin, or like FDR took over the world. That was, that was a symptom. The, the core problem was that a very bad and evil theory had come to consume the world, namely that um, you cannot trust society to run itself. Society has to be managed from the top down through intelligence, the acquisition of massive resources, and the assertion, unrelenting, escalating assertion of power against the spontaneous nature of the social order. Remarkable. And, you know, as horrible as all that stuff that I described to you was, it's awesome to consider that the whole of the intellectual establishment, in fact, embraced the very theory that had given rise to all the horrors in the world. So, yeah, you know, the politics may fall out uh, for or against FDR, for or against Hitler, for or against Stalin, and so on and so on, but the intellectual establishment was absolutely united, left, right, and center, and all across the board. We need central planning. We need it um, because otherwise we're going to have chaos. This is the view. Uh, and so this is what essentially Hayek had dealt with in his own career um, since probably the early 1920s. He began his intellectual life, of course, as everybody did in Fin de Siecle, you know, Vienna of that period, 
as a socialist, as every respectable intellectual had been. He converted to the cause against socialism um, under the influence of, of, of Ludwig von Mises. Mises had two great iterations of his, his argument. Uh, the first one was uh, came out in 1920 in which he took on the economics establishment. Yeah, keep in mind, there have been anti-socialists before Mises, all right? So we forget this. You know, let's not uh, drum up fake views of history as if the whole of humanity thought socialism was a fabulous idea until one great you know, mind rode in on a white horse and announced everybody that it wasn't a good idea. There have been many opponents of socialism you know, all throughout, uh, you know, the United States and, and France. I mean, you only need to look at Bostia for that matter. Um, and in Germany, too, a great liberal tradition in Germany. And, and, and the, you know, the, the writings against socialism would have filled um, rooms, whole libraries, actually, even before the Bolshevik Revolution and certainly after. So, you know, Mises wasn't some, some sort of lone figure who just you know, by himself, dreamed up this idea that socialism couldn't work. And for that, for that matter, you know, socialism had already failed to anybody who was paying any close attention at all in Russia. Uh, that failure had been clearly predicted, you know, as early as, you know, the 1880s and, and long before. I mean, for that matter, we only need to go back to Aristotle and see, you know, his, his prediction of a world without private property. So, yeah, let's, let's not, let's not, invent fake uh, intellectual histories as if Mises was was somehow singular uh, in his opposition to socialism. He wasn't his, even his own arguments were taken from elsewhere. All of intellectual life through all of history is is an unfolding of progressive iterations of, of improvement and learning, sometimes lost knowledge, um, uh, uh, things need to be restated in their own time and their own way. Um, so it's it's hard to it's hard to say precisely what was unique about Mises's argument because that at every point you could see that there had been a predecessor in his point, but nonetheless, he he crystallized it, he codified it, and he put it out in a way that um, got people's attention, you know. And getting people's attention is what is is ultimately what having intellectual influence is all about. It's not merely cranking out articles; it's also about getting people's attention. So his article did get attention. It was in 1920, and it got attention for a particular reason. He didn't take on the motives of the socialists. He, he didn't take on uh, their ideals. What he took on in, in particular was the technology of socialism itself. And he made a very simple, he made a very simple point. He said, um, rational economic calculation um, requires, requires prices, in order to generate balance sheets. And, and balance sheets are how we know whether or not something is being used in its most efficient possible way. In a normal market economy, we, we uh, thanks to the invention of money, which happened you know, umpteen years ago, uh, we figured out how to make um, uh, qualitative differences between goods and, and services turn into quantitative ones by re-rendering their value in terms of, of prices and measuring them according to the standards of profit and loss. And that becomes our guidepost, the thing that we use to def decide whether or not um, our resources should be used for this or for that. Should we use wood to build uh, houses or, or bridges or benches? You know, we uh, ultimately, uh, we wouldn't know the answer to that question or, or pulp it up into paper towels. You know, we wouldn't know the answers to these questions without the system of, of profit, lo profit and loss. But that system of profit and loss relies fundamentally on the existence of prices that are generated out of trade, which in turn require the existence of property in, in order to exist in the first place. So if you abolish private property, as particularly in, in capital goods, it's one thing to have final products, private property. I mean, actually, many socialists never really argued with that. Um, uh, you have to have it in, in capital goods, and that's what socialism was against. But without that, we're left with, uh, without uh, trade in capital goods, and without trade, we don't have accurate, we don't have prices, and without prices, we don't have 
the means to assemble the balance sheets without which we cannot assess the economic rationality of any projects, this project or that project, whether steel should be used for, for bridges, trains, or automobiles, or buildings, we, we, have, we have no clue. Uh, there's, there's information out there that we have to allow the market to generate. Uh, this is Mises' argument. And then he put it into, into this book, 1922 Socialism. Uh, it's book in 1922. And I, I love this book. I think this book is, is not well read. In fact, um, I, my own uh, theory is that most people who claim to be Misesians and claim to understand this stuff have never read this book because it's, it's gigantic. It's 850 pages. It's got a ton of social theory in it. It's got a new theory of property and social order. And it's, it's a marvelous, brilliant book. But I can guarantee you that the, the generation of intellectuals of Hayek's time in, in Vienna definitely read this book. And it shocked them because Mises took apart socialism in all of its iterations from the first page to the last. So, so Hayek left his socialism um, and gradually came to, to embrace a, a free market, basically an old, old style free market position. Well, Mises' article started a debate and the debate stretched on for essentially 25 years following the appearance of his 1920 piece. And, um, and the socialists uh, thought that they had won the debate. Namely, uh, what they came up with was a, a, a solution that said, look, uh, Mises has drawn attention to a technical problem. Uh, nowadays, we have a technical solution to these problems. We have computers, we have mathematics, we have the ability to uh, observe and process and 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 render the existence of shortages and 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 surpluses. We we can plan just based on looking the world around us and generating these prices through through technical solutions. Uh, thank you, Mises. We didn't know this was actually a problem of socialism, but thanks to your article. Uh, we now realize that socialism just has to be extra smart. We have to be extra brilliant. We have to be, you know, have ever smarter people and ever ever more amazing tools. It's funny because, you know, when you, you go back and read Mises' article, uh, he's funny because he he nails the socialists like completely. <clears throat> Pointing out that they, most all their work, I mean like 99% of their work consists of railing against capitalism and very little, uh, just a handful of scraps are, are explaining how it is that socialism would actually work. I mean, that's what Mises called them on. Well, now Mises has, has, has pressed the issue and, and, and gotten the leading intellectuals in, in all over the world. It was Russia and, and Germany and Vienna and the United States and all over the UK got all the leading socialist intellectuals to try to, to address the question, how are we going to do this? And their answer was, in a way, worse. Um, because Mises had presented the problem as a purely technical one, and they came up with a purely technical solution. Um, and now Hayek participated in this debate. In fact, Hayek had been the, the editor of an English language book, I think, um, called Economic Planning in the, in the Socialist Commonwealth, something that I can't, can't quite remember the book. Um, in which he had featured Mises' article, you know, sort of front and center. So, so Hayek was very much interested in this debate. But by by uh, by 1945, the world had completely completely changed. I mean, we we left the Great Depression. Um, you know, where again the use of economic planning had driven, and Hayek was of course going nuts about this because, and Mises too. I mean, this whole generation of free market intellectuals was mortified at how the Great Depression had been handled by the intellectual leaders of of the time in the, in the developed world because they, you know, they understood that all the new deals and economic planning and labor union controls and price controls and everything else had, had managed to forestall uh, economic recovery in grim and gruesome ways. So uh, Hayek began to discern something that was actually extremely important. And I, I think this is where Hayek you know, really excelled. He began to look around and see that that the that the intellectual problem is not just merely about socialism itself. There is a relationship in Hayek's mind 
between what FDR was doing in the U.S. and what Stalin was doing in Russia, what Hitler did in Germany, um, and what what was being done in in the U.K. and was being attempted all over the world, and the relationship was is not just simply about socialism or the as Mises saw it, it was the problem of the collective ownership of, of uh, capital goods. Um, Hayek saw that that was not the only issue, that was just merely a symptom of a larger issue. And the larger issue was the attempted planning in general, which was taking place all over the world, not just in, in Russia, but, but all over the Western world. Um, every price control, you know, every attempt to, uh, to, to tax and spend, uh, to raise uh, employment, to uh, pick and choose winners and losers in the industrial sectors, to move uh, peoples around in a way that, that fit with a more of a rational plan for how society can be constructed. So, uh, and, and Hayek was disturbed by this because he knew that the answers to Mises were the people who were trying to answer me had not actually dealt with the problem. They, they generated a what seemed to be on paper a technical solution. Their, their solution was, look, it's not a problem. We'll go out and find the information we'll need. We need. We'll put that information into our uh, into our models, spin out solutions, and impose them from from the top. What Hayek did was he understood that um, they were they were presuming that the answer to their to the problem was was a given that they had access to that information. That this was just something they had assumed, whereas in fact the reality was that the information necessary, the knowledge necessary to to administer a, 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 an economic plan that was rational, was ultimately inaccessible to the planning <coughs> elite, that there was simply no way they could gain access to it. And what information they could have access to was typically dated information that was of no relevance to a changing progressive society. And to the extent that planners could, could work at all and approximating something uh, like a, a rational plan. It was essentially unrelated to reality. <clears throat> the reality is the world of change, and the planners can only access old information. But he went further than that, because he was taking on really what, what is really fundamentally a methodological and epistemological issue within the social sciences. Um, that's why this article, uh, no, it's actually beer. So. Um, that's why this article is so significant. It's not just about um, hitting, you know, politicians and bureaucrats who are trying to plan the world. He went to the heart of the methodological foundations of the social sciences, which had ever more in the course of the, the, the century, and really probably since the 1890s or so, and it just gotten worse over time, um, evermore, the social sciences were attempting to ape the natural sciences in terms of its attempt to run experiments and collect data, uh, run control groups, um, uh, use the method as, methods of positivism. And, and Hayek, Hayek's argument, uh, which is that ultimately this knowledge that's necessary to run these kind of exper experiments is not accessible to the planners at all. But he was saying even more fundamentally, and this is actually where the article gets really radical, it's not accessible to intellectuals at all. That the kind of knowledge that's necessary to run society and to make, make life work is, is deeply embedded in the experiences of people where they are and ultimately in the individual human mind and is only imperfectly rendered in the course of society through a gradual evolution of, of institutions that give us clues and ideas uh, and signals to navigate the world. And these institutions include, of course, market prices, right? What are market prices? I mean, they're, they're, they're past data. They give us 
a, a beautiful record of trades that have already occurred and the terms under which they've already occurred that give us a chance to look back and say, did we make money or did we lose money? And that, that allows us to, to get a sense of, of how to crawl forward through entrepreneurial judgment. Uh, and, and that's very helpful, but prices are in, in, in hikes. You are in, in no sense marching orders. They don't, they don't tell you, um, they don't give you a, a fully scientifically accurate rendering of the status of the world. They give us the closest thing we have in economics to an approximation of, of uh, the kind of data we're looking at, but uh, that we need but that these prices are, are emergent prices and they flow from individual decision-making. And yet prices are only just one form of the institutions that we need to, to make society work. Uh, they're, they're just one expression of a larger problem. There are all kinds of institutions that exist, um, culture and manners and mores, laws, uh, trade, habits, um, you know, any sort of predictable patterns among uh, human association uh, that, that we believe we can count on it's, to some extent, these are all emergent institutions. They all grow out of our individual experiences um, and are interpreted by our, our individual minds um, and always represent a, a kind of a the closest approximation that we can ever make to discerning the, the, the kinds of data that is necessary to, to make the social order operate. And so this, this information um, is radically localized and it's super uh, radically dispersed among individual minds and um, emerges only in the course of, of social resolution through, through institutions that we observe, among which prices. So, so, so this knowledge is ultimately inaccessible to any individual mind. Um, we're all just sort of crawling our way through. Uh, we're, we're observing what's around us, processing it in our individual minds in the way that most makes sense to us, and making speculative attempts every single day uh, about, about uh, what's the most rational behavior forward. What's, what's the kind of behavior that we can, we can undertake that's, that's least irrational, I guess is another way to put it. But, um, but this knowledge is never accessible to, to any individual. There's, there's no way that any individual mind can comprehend the billions and trillions and really infinite bits of information that are, that are super dispersed uh, throughout the whole of society uh, that would be necessary to make anything like a rational plan. Um, the intellectual project at its very root is fundamentally flawed. That, that's, that's an extraordinary claim because, I mean, Hayek's not just taking on uh, socialism, you see. He's taking on the, the whole existence of... Um, of um, the social sciences, you know, as it had come to be seen. And in fact, when I look at this article and see that it was published in, of all places, the American Economic Review, I'm almost in awe of it. I mean, I can't, I, I can't even understand what led the editors to publish it at all, because it's so radical and so... Now, I want to read some of it because I think it's so, so magnificently crafted. I mean, it's quite simply, you know, like the greatest article you'll ever read. I mean, it's, it's that good. Um, uh, I, and I don't entirely, I can't entirely account for why, why uh, American Economic Review published it, except that as I look back at his biography, let's see, um, Hayek had been, had been pulled away from Vienna, um, I guess in something like, I'm, I'm estimating here, 1932, um, uh, Lord Robbins at uh, the London School of Economics had, had, uh, um, recruited Hayek because he had a, a big problem, and the problem was the rise of Keynes, right? And he was looking for an opponent, opponent of Keynesianism to come in and wage an intellectual battle. So Hayek took off and and did. I mean, he, he set the world on fire, and he was just fabulous, and you know, battled the Keynesians as nobody else ever had throughout all those years in in London. But then he came to the University of Chicago, and I'm trying to think. 
exactly the year because Mises had come over here um, four years later in 1949. Uh, no, he had come over in 1940. He had moved from Geneva because uh, he had moved to Geneva in 1934. So he was there six years and came over to the United States, arrived in 1940. I don't think Hayek was here yet. So Hayek must have, must have come a few years later. Um, maybe, yeah, maybe it was 1944, 19. So this article pretty much uh, appears about the time he arrives at the University of Chicago. So that was about the timing. So maybe that's why. The American Economic Review wrote it, ran it. I'm, I'm not entirely sure. And he was a he was a big shot. I mean, he already set the world on fire, and he was considered the world's leading opponent to Keynes. So maybe that's why they ran it. It can't have been any other any other reason, um, because the thing is so. But let me just let me just kind of. Uh, I sent you a link to the article, and somebody else uploaded the PDF. I just want to read some of this because. Because it has one of the great, and I've I've just dissected this article in detail so many times, countless times. You know, I just I can't I can't believe how many times I read it, and it never gets old. It's so, um, you know, ostensibly I think this is what's important about this article. This article is ostensibly dealing with economic planning, and it, and it speaks very much to the economic profession. I mean, you recommend this, you know, to the average person, maybe they don't entirely understand, you know, why it's significant because it's really written to economists. And is dealing with economic problems and he uses a lot of economic jargon in it. But as he approaches the end, he can see, you can see what's happening here. Hayek's not just addressing economists, and he's not just addressing the problem of, of socialism or economic planning more generally. He's addressing the epistemolo epistemological foundations of the social sciences themselves, utterly condemning um, positivism. That is the application of the methods that pertain to the natural sciences to the to, to a world of human choice. You know, he says it doesn't pertain, but you can see, like right towards the end, that he's laying the foundation of an entirely new research program in the social sciences itself. So he up he wants to basically upend not just economics, but you know, politics and social theory, right? So. He, he gets there, and he hints at it. It's very beautiful. But let me just start the article, because I, I really want to read the beginning, because this has one of the great <laughs> first paragraphs of any article I've, I've ever read. Sometimes I think people tend to think of Hayek as not being a good writer. I mean, he's a little opaque, right? You can read a lot of Hayek and, um, and have it still elude your grasp. Uh, but this article is a little different, it's a little clearer. You can tell that he spent, you know, like vast amounts of time on it. So he begins with this extraordinary statement. What is the problem we wish to solve when we try to construct a rational economic order? On certain familiar assumptions, the answer is simple enough. If we possess all the relevant information, if we can start out from a given system of preferences, and if we command complete knowledge of the available means, the problem which remains is purely one of logic. That is, the answer to the question of what is the best use of the available means is implicit in our assumptions. The conditions which the solution of this optimum problem must satisfy have been fully worked out and can be stated best in mathematical form. At the briefest, there are that the marginal rates of substitution between any two commodities or factors must be the same in all different uses. This, however, is emphatically not the economic problem which society faces. And the economic calculus, which we have developed to solve this logical problem, though an important step toward the solution of the economic problem of society, does not yet provide an answer to it. The reason for this is that, and this is a critical, a critical sentence, the data from which the economic calculus starts are never for the whole society given to a single mind. 
that are never given to a single mind, which could work out the implications and can never be so given. So what does Hayek mean by the single mind? Well, certainly he means the dictator, right? But more than that, he means the intellectual. He means the writer, the thinker, anyone. What he's positing is the intractable existence of, of, of an immutable ignorance that is pervasive and universal among all people at all times. No one has access to the data that would be necessary to run the kinds of formulas and calculations that would enable society to be rationally planned. No one has that data and no one ever will. I mean, this is a shocking claim, All right, This is taking aim at the heart of the social sciences as they had developed over the last half century. So you're already getting the hint. I mean, it's, it's, like, it's like ominous. It's, it's awesome what he's saying. Let me keep going. The peculiar character of the problem of a rational economic order is determined precisely by the fact that the knowledge of the circumstances of which we must make use never exists in any concentrated or integrated form, but rather solely as the dispersed bits of incomplete and frequently contradictory knowledge which all the separate individuals possess. Individuals have knowledge, it's incomplete, it's sometimes contradictory, but it's radically dispersed. It's everywhere. It's ungatherable, and in a sense, undiscernible and unseeable. The economic problem of society is thus not merely a problem of how to allocate given resources, if given is taken to mean given to a single mind, which deliberately solves the problem set by these data. It is rather a problem of how to secure the best use of resources known to any of the members of society for ends whose relative importance only these individuals know. Or, to put it briefly, it is a problem of the utilization of knowledge, which is not given to anyone in its totality. Wow. So I don't even know what to say about that, but I mean, that's, that's awesome. How do you use knowledge in a way that's best? All the knowledge is out there and the best that's the best that's for society. What he says is that the knowledge is never given in its totality to any single mind, to anyone ever. So simply, quite simply, it cannot be done. Which, by implication, is why we need radical decentralization. And uh, I, I would say uh, there's there's a there's an undercurrent here of of um, I, I would say there's an undercurrent here of that's undeniably anarchistic. I mean, you just can't. I don't, I don't know how anybody could deny that. It's just I mean, Hayek himself wasn't an anarchist, but but uh, that that's what the implications of this article clearly are. I, I want to keep reading if it's okay with you. This character, the fundamental problem has, I'm afraid, been obscured rather than illuminated by the many recent refinements of economic theory, particularly by the many uses made of mathematics. Though the problem with which I want to primarily deal in this paper is a problem of rational economic organization, I shall in its course be led again and again to point to its close connection. This makes the point I was making earlier. To certain methodological questions. Many of the points I wish to make are indeed conclusions towards which diverse paths of reasoning have unexpectedly converged. But now, as I see these problems, this is no accident. See, what he says is, I've been thinking about this shit for a very long time, and now I'm seeing like the core. It seems to me that many of the current disputes with regard to both economic theory and economic policy have their common, many of the disputes, not just Keynesianism, socialism, interventionism, 
uh, positivism, you know, all these issues, all these disputes, all of them. They all have a, the, the common origin and a misconception about the nature of the economic problem of society. This misconception in turn is due to an erroneous transfer to social phenomena of the habits of thought we have developed in dealing with the phenomena and nature. Okay, so you see, now here's, he's dipping into um, a little bit of methodological dualism here. He says there's one method that may pertain to, to the study of um, the physical world, um, to the natural sciences, as, as they, were, they were called back then, or as we now call science, really, and, um, and, and the understanding of society. So what's the difference? I mean, I don't want to go into it, but um, here, because Hayek doesn't go into it in this article, but the, you know, the difference is when the natural sciences were dealing with regularized phenomena um, that can be perfectly predicted, there can be controlled experiments, uh, we can have access to all the relevant data because it's, it's repetitive, is, is not flow from any kind of choice or randomness, but rather is, is a given to us. Uh, within uh, the social order, who's dealing with an, with uh, an ever-present reality of change and and human choice, and um, you know the 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 decisive and critical point about the social order itself, which is that it's an emergent phenomenon that stems from um, from the human will. You know that that it's it's an outcome of 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 an of an evolutionary process um, that extends from the choices that people make, and therefore it cannot be studied and understood the same way as the natural sciences. Okay. Um, so now he backs up a little bit. We're already in section two. He backs up just a little bit. In ordinary language, we describe by the word planning the complex of interrelated decisions about the allocations of our available resources. All economic activity is, in this sense, planning. And in any society in which many people collaborate, this planning, whoever does it, will in some measure have to be based on knowledge, which in the first instance is not given to the planner, but to somebody else, which somehow will have to be conveyed to the planner. The various ways in which the knowledge in which people base their plans is communicated to them is the crucial part for any crucial problem for any theory explaining the economic process, and the problem of what is the best way of utilizing knowledge initially dispersed among all people, is at least one of the main problems of economic policy, or of designating an efficient economic system. The answer to this question is closely connected with that other question which arises here, that of who is to do the planning. It is about this question that all the dispute about economic planning centers. This is not a dispute about whether planning is to be done or not. We all plan every day. It is a dispute as to whether planning is to be done centrally by one authority, whether intellectuals or a dictator or whatever, for the whole economic system, or it is to be divided among many di different individuals and institutions and experiences of time and place. Planning in the specific sense in which the term is used in contemporary controversy necessarily means central economic planning, direction of the whole economic system <clears throat> according to one unified plan. Competition, on the other hand, means decentralized planning by many separate persons. The halfway house between the two, about which many people talk, but which few people like when they see it, is a delegation of planning to organize industries, in other words, monopoly. Which of these systems is likely to be more efficient depends mainly on the question under which of them we can expect the fuller use of will be made of existing knowledge. This in turn depends on whether we are more likely to succeed in putting at the disposal of a, sin of a single central authority all the knowledge which ought to be used, but which is initially dispersed among many, among many different individuals, or in conveying to the individuals such knowledge as they need in order to enable them to fit the plans with those of others. In any case, I can't read you the entire article as much as I would like to. This is one of those articles I'd like to commit to memory, but I would like to go down to the end. And if you're following along, um, 
he he ends disappointingly actually i wish he hadn't ended this way because it's funny it's like you finished the article and then um decided to use the occasion to go after his his uh uh joseph uh schumpeter you know who then at that time was teaching at harvard and had uh, weighed in on the socialist calculation debate and then probably the most idiotic you know fashion that one can possibly imagine I think this was in his great, great, otherwise great book called Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy. Schumpeter has a whole chapter about how socialism can can easily work. And and it drove Hayek just like like nuts. So you have to remember that Schumpeter comes from Hayek's world in old Vienna, right? Schumpeter is a big deal, his 1915 book on method and uh, economic development. I mean, he was a big shot, right? So now he's at Harvard and just making a mess out of everything, as, as always. I mean, I think Schumpeter was absolutely brilliant, but on, on this point, Hayek was exactly right to go after him, but it's kind of disappointing because after, you know, here we are, um, uh, you know, whatever it is, 70 years later or something, um, uh, nobody cares about Schumpeter's argument, <laughs> you know, and it's Hayek's great article that, that, that lives. So let me see if I can find uh, the critical part here. Yeah, I think it, it's it's not section seven. I think yeah, it's it's the it's the last part of um, of section section six. Actually, you should just end it with section section six. I mean, I'm not his editor, but there you go. The problem which we hear. We, which we meet here is by no means peculiar to economics. And this is where it gets like really radical because he, he, he signals economists, this isn't just about economics, this is about the whole world, but arises in connection with nearly all truly social phenomena. He could have taken out the word nearly actually. With language and with our most, most of our cultural inheritance and constitutes really the central theoretical problem of all science, social science. So now you're getting like a hint that Hayek's not just speaking about economics, he's talking about the core theoretical problem of all social science. Um, and then he weirdly quotes Alfred Whitehead here, and uh, it's a brilliant quote, but I, it's disappointing because you, you want it to be Hayek. Alfred Whitehead said in another connection, it is a Profoundly erroneous truism repeated by all copybooks and by all men, eminent people when they're making specific speeches that we should cultivate the habit of thinking uh, what we are doing. And um, Whitehead says the precise opposite is the case. Civil this is a beautiful statement. Civilization advances by extending the number of important operations which we can perform without thinking about them. It goes on, this is of profound significance in the social field. We make constant use of formulas, symbols, and rules whose meaning we do not understand, and through the use of which we avail ourselves of the assistance of knowledge which we individually do not possess. We have developed these practices and institutions by building upon habits and institutions with the, which have proved successful in their own sphere, and which in turn have become the foundation of the civilization we have built up. Yeah, wow, American Economic Review, 1945, right? You can't write that shit today, right? Unbelievable. The price system is just one of those formations which man has learned to use, though he's still very far from having learned to make the best use of it. After he had stumbled upon it without understanding it, though it is, n it is not through it, not only a division of labor, but also the coordinated util utilization of resources based on equally divided knowledge has become possible. The people who like to deride any suggestion that this may be may be so, usually distort the argument by insinuating that it asserts by some miracle, just by some miracle, that that uh, just that sort of system has spontaneously grown up, which is best suited to modern civilization. It is the other way around. Uh, man has been able to develop 
the division of labor on which our civilization is based because he happened to stumble upon a method which made it possible. Had he not done so, he might still have developed some other altogether different type of civilization, something like the state of termite ants or some altogether unimaginable type. All that we can say is that nobody has yet succeeded in designing an alternative system in which certain features of the existing one can be preserved, which are dear even to those whose most violently assail it, such as particularly the extent to which the individual can choose his pursuits and consequently freely use his own knowledge and skill. Okay, so uh, you don't have to read between the lines much there. This is a hymn to individual volition, uh, towards liberalism and individual decision-making, and an utter and slashing, devastating commentary on anyone who would presume to override the decisions of individuals in favor of some central uh, plan. He's calling out the planners, the dictators, the intellectuals, the presidents of the world and saying, you know what? You don't know. You don't know what you're doing. You're faking it. You're pretending. Uh, what you claim you, you know, you in fact uh, do not know. And, and that that knowledge that's necessary to do what you claim you're doing is ultimately completely inaccessible to you. It is, it is dispersed, it's changing, it's embedded in the experiences of individuals, and that knowledge <coughs> that individuals have is radically associated with the time and the place, and it's incomplete knowledge. A lot of that knowledge is tacit, meaning that the individuals themselves can't even access the fullness of it any more than you can explain um, how you ride a bike, you know? Um, and a lot of it is contradictory. So um, this is the nature of knowledge. It's the nature of the knowledge we have about our world. It's always, we always look through the, the, the glass darkly, faced with an uncertain future, faced with incomplete understanding of, our, of ourselves and of that of others. And if it's not even accessible to individuals, and as the, the, the only remote chance we have of succeeding in this world is for individuals to, to act on the knowledge that they perceive, as incomplete and contradictory as it may be, but the idea that we're going to um, uh, uh, outsource the task of, of the difficult process of building a civilization to a group of high-minded intellectuals or dictators or planners who have no stake in the outcome and who ultimately are, have no access to what we know as individuals is utterly crazy and uh, to, to Hayek's mind, demonstrably uh, evil and, and dangerous. So but that's the use of knowledge in society, and that's why it's such an epic um, article. Um, okay, let me just roll back a second, because I have a couple of minutes left. Actually, let me just quickly check the chat window. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I haven't been watching it because I've been so... <laughs> the towel. Um, so let me just back up just really quickly and tell you, um, just very, very quickly in, in, in conclusion about my own experience with this article. Um, I couldn't understand it and I, I, I can't even tell you why I didn't understand it, but I knew I, I realized I didn't understand it when I was asked by a, a pro big prominent national publication to write an obituary on, on Hayek, um, after his death. Um, you know, I, I got his liberalism more or less right. You know, I was able to write about his capital theories, business cycle theory, wrote to search him, all this other stuff. But I you know that, you know, this 1945 article, Use of Knowledge of Society, set Hayek up for a whole research program that lasted um, throughout the 1950s and 60s and 70s, all the way up into his death, um, and got ever more elaborate and became the critical contribution he had made, about which, you know, thousands of dissertations have been written. I mean, this, it's this insight that made Hayek the most important thinker of the 20th century, and suddenly I found myself unable to render the argument um, in a way that was coherent and clear for a national publication, you know, for a popular audience. And there's nothing like the demand to explain to people in popular terms uh, a point 
that makes you realize you don't understand it. I mean, I, I simply couldn't explain it. I was able to knock out a couple of sentences, but my, 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 uh, my rendering of his argument sounded trivial. I didn't quite get it. And then I had this weird experience in, in Brazil. Um, and again, this is all about the question of, you know, why does the social order look the way it does? You know, why are there beautiful skyscrapers in your town? You know, why is it that people are able to navigate their way from here to, to there on the, on the way to work? You know, how is it that, um, you know, I can, I can be carrying around, uh, you know, an iPhone that's, that's made from, from parts from, for 50 different uh, countries, uh, the accumulation of, of technology dating back decades and decades and even centuries. Um, you know, why is it the, the way, uh, why is it that things are the way they are? And, and the, the question is, is it because they are planned to be that way? You know, is there some, is there some master hand at work making things uh, happen? Or is it a result of what I call spontaneous order? The gradual emergence of, of cooperative relationships out of micro decision making that's radically associated with individuals through the institutions that have emerged all around us, through opportunities and choices that are given to us at the moment that are coordinated through things like the price system and trade relationships and uh, uh, customs and all these other things. I mean, once you look at the thing, uh, once you look at the problem that way, the world becomes a very different place. But I had a, I had a hard time somehow seeing this point until I was in uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil. Because I, as I say, I'd been exposed to hike many times throughout my life. It was in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and I was up at the top of one of the, the tallest buildings in this town. And I don't know if you've ever been there, but it's, it's something like 11 million people live in this crazy place. And you can rotate and you know, do a 360 degrees in all direction, and your eyes cannot see the end of the buildings, like as far as the eyes, eyes can see in all directions. The sight, like just from a pure physiological point of view or sensual point of view, was so immense that, that it suddenly struck me and I, I stood there on the top of the building and I said these words to myself, I cannot comprehend this. Okay, that was the phrase I uttered to myself. And then that's when it struck me and it was like, you know, appalling conversion. I realized no one can comprehend this. That's awesome, that's awesome. And it was, that's, that was the insight um, that made me realize that ultimately the social order, I don't care how big the government gets or how much planning goes on or how much regulation comes, ultimately <clears throat> the shape of the social order uh, emerges out of uh, spontaneous actions of, of individuals that no planner can have access to. And I, I think this is a very, I'm sorry, I'm going over, but this is a, I think, why is it important that libertarians understand this? I, th I think it's important because we all tend to, I think, exaggerate um, the extent to which the will of our overlords is decisive in shaping the world around us. It is not. Uh, government planners can have wishes and desires. Um, they can try to pass laws that bring about certain results. You know, and as we know, there's many unintended uh, consequences from that they don't understand. But in the end, they are powerless. All the powers in the world, all the intellectuals in the world are powerless as compared to the awesome uh, cumulative, uh, what do you say, uh, aggregation of the micro units of information that go into the building of a social order. Ultimately, a social order is the knowledge that makes it necessary to build is dispersed and inaccessible. And ultimately, what it means is that this world cannot be controlled. It can't be controlled by anyone. You know, uh, governments can only do harm. They can mess up the planning of individuals, and they do, and they do it all around us every day. We all know this, right? But over the long run, uh, the, uh, the vessel 
of uh, the, the the magic sauce, or you know, the the thing that makes the social order function and tick to the extent that it does at all, uh, is not due to anybody's plans, uh, but rather due to uh, the decisions of time and place that are in, uh, that are based on incomplete knowledge, uh, uh, tacit knowledge, sometimes contradictory knowledge that are embedded ultimately in the individual human mind, and I think this insight should give us great hope. I think um, what it means is that the planners can't win. They, they can't succeed, ultimately. Uh, they, they stand no chance against this massive, mighty apparatus of dispersed knowledge. In many ways, Hayek's insight also anticipates so many modern institutions around us, like the distributed network, you know? like uh, the crowds, crowdsourcing of information that goes into the building of things like WordPress or Wikipedia or uh, ledger technology. Um, you know, uh, the, all of these things are drawing on, on uh, the, they're, they're inviting the world community in uh, to make changes at the margin. The results of which are always and everywhere larger than the, the, the sum of its parts, and the making of which will always be inaccessible to the outside observer. Yeah, that's it. I, you could look at Wikipedia as an example. You know, who made it? Who wrote it? Come on, everybody. You know, um, there's no way to know. You can understand a single entry, maybe a single edit. You cannot comprehend the whole. But it's true for the whole world. It's true for, for everything. So this is a radical idea. And, it, and it, it fundamentally changes the character of the project of social sciences and, and certainly radically upends the possibility of politics to make a positive, positive contribution to the world. In fact, I would go further and say that Hayek's article uh, is, a, is a devastating um, indictment of politics as we know it, and as it has always been known, from the age of the pharaohs and the Caesars all the way to the dictators of the 20th century, and the pretentious planners of the 21st century, none of them are acting with integrity, intellectual integrity. They are all ultimately liars. They're making it up as they go along. Okay, um, I'm done. I'm so sorry for having gone over. Thank you so much for coming. I love this article, as you can tell. <laughs> and I, I hope you'll uh, spend some time with it, contemplating its implications. It, um, it has to be read once and again, and then again, and then again. And no matter how many times you read it, you'll never quite, I think, uh, fully uh, extract all of its implications for the way we view the world. So thank you so much for coming tonight and for being here with me and for being a member of Liberty.me and for making this community a wonderful crowdsourced uh, source of uh, information to help free our lives. Uh, I'm so happy with the way things have been going on Liberty Me recently. We've got so many new members, so many exciting things happening. So, And it's always my pleasure to spend Sunday night with you. It's my favorite night of the week. Thank you so much. Uh, all the best to you. <laughs> okay. Take care. Bye-bye.